I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, and today we're going to talk about two guidelines published by the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases on the clinical assessment and management of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD. There are very few things that we see more of and notice less than NAFLD. NAFLD is present in over a quarter of the population in general and about half of all people with type 2 diabetes, and it doesn't exist in isolation. The relation between NAFLD and the metabolic syndrome, including obesity and diabetes, is bidirectional. Each one makes the other worse. Let's clarify terminology to start out. NAFLD refers to all grades of fatty liver disease, and that's defined as greater than 5% of liver cells having microvesicular steatosis when there's no other identified cause for that being the case. What really concerns us, though, with NAFLD is when fatty infiltration of the liver leads to inflammation. Then it's called NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. This occurs in about one out of six people with NAFLD with a higher proportion occurring in people with type 2 diabetes. When NASH progresses to high-grade fibrosis, which is defined as greater than or equal to stage 2 fibrosis, then there's an increased rate and an increased risk of progression to cirrhosis and liver failure. When we evaluate patients with NAFLD, the algorithm we're going to discuss is essentially constructed to identify those patients who are unlikely to have clinically significant fibrosis so that those people can be confidently given lifestyle interventions and follow up without a need for further referral. Individuals who are at higher risk can then receive further evaluation. NAFLD is usually found incidentally on ultrasound done for some other reason or as part of an evaluation of abnormal LFTs or as part of targeted screening. Targeted screening can be considered for people at increased risk of NAFLD, such as those with type 2 diabetes or obesity with metabolic complications. Screening is best done using a validated NAFLD risk calculator, such as the FIB4, which we'll talk about in a minute. So how should we approach NAFLD? First, other etiologies of liver disease need to be reasonably ruled out. I say reasonably. The extent of the evaluation that's needed here is a matter of clinical judgment and is not directly addressed in the guidelines. So I'll give you my opinion. Ask about alcohol use and check hepatitis serologies as well as ferritin and a celiac disease panel. Additional testing such as ANA, anti-smooth muscle antibody, alpha-1 antitrypsin, ceruloplasm, microsomal antibody, and protein electrophoresis may or may not be indicated. Your clinical judgment. Patients who are at high risk of NAFLD on the basis of metabolic risk factors or when fatty infiltration of the liver is incidentally identified by imaging should undergo primary risk assessment with a validated NAFLD risk calculator. The best validated and most frequently used risk calculator is the FIB4. The FIB4 score is calculated using things that we already usually have. It's a simple algorithm where you input patients' age, their ALT, their AST, and platelet count. I've given links below for an online calculator and an app. Patients with a FIB4 score less than 1.3 are unlikely to have advanced fibrosis, and that's the key. They can receive lifestyle advice and periodic reassessment. If the FIB4 score is in the intermediate range that's greater than 1.3 but less than 2.67, then secondary risk assessment should be performed. This is most commonly done by ordering a vibration-controlled elastography test, VCTE, also known as the FibroScan. Elastography measures liver stiffness, and liver stiffness increases with increasing severity of liver fibrosis. If the fibroscan is less than eight, then the likelihood of advanced fibrosis is low. 
and the patient can be periodically reassessed in our primary care offices. If the elastography score is greater than eight, or if the liver function tests are persistently elevated, then the guidelines recommend referral to GI for further evaluation. Let's now talk about treatment. Treatment can be divided into three parts, lifestyle, medication, and bariatric surgery. Let's first talk about lifestyle. A healthy diet and exercise are of critical importance here. It is always even more so when you have NAFLD. While any weight loss is good, 10% or greater weight loss is often needed to improve inflammation and fibrosis. It's worth noting with regard to diet that high fructose consumption increases the risk of advanced fibrosis independent of calories. Exercise is critically important, as some studies show it can prevent or improve NASH independent from its effect on weight. Next, medications. Currently, there are no FDA-approved medications for NASH, but there are medications that are approved for other indications that have evidence of benefit for NASH. Those medicines include vitamin E 800 international units daily, pioglitazone, and the GLP-1 receptor agonist with the best evidence existing for semaglutide. The dual agonist, terzepatide, has demonstrated average weight loss of over 20% and a reduction of liver fat, suggesting that it might benefit NASH, and there are more trials to come there. Finally, bariatric surgery can resolve NASH and improve hepatic fibrosis. If someone with type 2 diabetes has NASH, we should preferentially select either pioglitazone or a GLP-1 when treating their diabetes, since there's evidence that that helps NASH as well as lower blood sugar. This is a new and confusing area for a lot of us, so I'm putting a smart phrase below that you can feel free to copy, adapt, and use in your EHR. I'm interested in your thoughts about the topic and whether sharing smart phrases in this column might be helpful to you. And if so, what you'd like to see in those smart phrases. Please leave your comments in the comments section below. I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, and this is Medscape.